More than half a million Americans are homeless. And this year, the crisis has reached a tipping point in cities across the country, with overcrowded shelters and homeless encampments taking over street corners. Los Angeles is the epicenter, with the largest homeless population in the country. About 20% of the chronically homeless live here, and fixing the problem is the city's top priority. My first act as mayor will be to declare a state of emergency on homelessness. In the city of big dreams, tens of thousands of people sleep on the streets every night. But despite that harsh reality, there are teams of healthcare warriors who believe they can help end the crisis one patient at a time. Does anybody here have any medical concerns? It is truly not an overstatement to say that this is a crisis, this is a pandemic. The medical care is one of the root causes of the reasons that people are homeless. Um, and I think if we ignore that issue, uh, all these other programs are just not gonna work as well. In partnership with USA Today's Humankind team, we travel to Los Angeles and meet one medical team trying to end the stigma and see the people behind homelessness. We're not all just crazy, dirty individuals. At the base of everything, we started out human beings. And well-known chefs are coming together to give back to their communities through food. USA Today Entertainment reporter Ralphie Aversa sits down with world-renowned chef and author Marcus Samuelson. The word restaurant means to restore your spirit, restore your community. Great food does not have a zip code. It does not have an address. It should be for everybody. Every morning, Jessica Jimenez and Kat Persakian head out on the streets of Los Angeles. They visit homeless encampments and offer medical care. They're part of a street medicine team called Healthcare in Action. Good morning, street medicine. Is anybody interested in any medical care? This particular encampment on the border of Hollywood and West Hollywood is home to about 20 homeless people most of whom are LGBTQ. Yeah, we can do the same thing. Homeless populations are at high risk for communicable diseases like hepatitis and HIV. It's one of the reasons why medical care is so important on the streets. So do you guys want to come to the van or do you want to do it in here? Uh, can we do it here? Yeah, I can bring it. Here, there's been several reported cases of monkeypox. So the team is giving out vaccines. Yeah, it shouldn't, it shouldn't hurt that much. Oh. You're done. Thank you. While the team focuses on medical care, they also offer counseling for addiction and mental health. And they have a support team to help patients get housing. Because we're out here so often, we've developed a rapport with a lot of these individuals. You know, they know that we are friend and not foe. And so they're a lot more willing to engage us. You always look beautiful, by the way. <laughs> We ask if we can interview one of the patients, but most are reluctant to go on camera. I'm sorry. No, you're, you're out here doing it. You're out here doing the best you can. Thank and you. I can see it, okay? 28-year-old Kayla agrees to talk to us. In part, she says, because she's grateful for the medical care she gets from this team. These people come and make sure we have what we need. Like, I don't know. I probably wouldn't be doing as well as I am right now if they didn't come in my life. Kayla says she really needs health care. She is HIV positive and recently found out she has monkeypox. Being homeless, I, to get to in Cedar sinai and to get to my primary doctor is hard. It's not easy. No one helps. No one helps. Like, if you guys were on this side, you would see a different version of what goes on and like a different aspect of life because like, I don't want to be here. I really don't want to be here, but like. <laughs> Kayla's been living on the streets for three years. She ended up homeless after she came out as transgender to her family. 
In the U.S., one in three transgender adults has experienced homelessness. Kayla also struggles with an addiction to crystal meth. What is the relationship between homelessness and addiction? Being on the street, there are 10 million things that you need to worry about from day to day. You know, where's your next meal coming from? Am I safe? So when you're dealing with those things on top of having a mental health issue, um, sometimes people just end up falling into addiction. That's the way that they are dealing with the situation that they are in. It's easy to just throw everybody into this like faceless, nameless pot, but these are people. They have stories. <laughs> Kayla says she wants to be a singer. After she freshens up, she agrees to tell us more about her life and meets us on a nearby street corner. I went to college. Okay, a lot of people can't say that they went to a Cal State University. I've been to Africa, I've been to Amsterdam. We find out Kayla grew up in a middle-class family. She comes from a nearby suburb called Downey. Do you feel like you belong here more than you do in your own house? It's more acceptable for me to be me over here than it is in Downey. My mom specifically made us grow up there because of the school systems, but then she was just too caught up in her Christianity, fake homophobia to like, and now I ended up coming out here anyway. What do you want people to know about the homeless population here? We're not here because we're lazy. We're not here because of like, we just gave up on life. Stop homeless people that just be like, walking with no shoes and shit. They have gone on a trip and like they haven't come back down like because like their mental health is being ignored and they don't know how to like live normally anymore and no one's helping them because it's like you're crazy i would say 90 percent maybe even of our patients have ptsd depression anxiety um, so much mental health needs this job teaches me every single day that all of our patients were in situations where how could we not have expected them to get there? They were dealt so many tough hands. It's a miracle they're still here. After meeting Kayla, we follow the team to another location a few blocks away. They're treating Susan, a 35-year-old trans woman. She's been on and off the streets for 12 years. It's like almost textbook perfect. <laughs> like more than 20% of the patients they treat, and like Kayla, Susan is also HIV positive, but she's gone untreated for more than a decade. I know tomorrow's your birthday, and I kind of want to bring you like a little cupcake or something, but I don't know if it's going to mess your stomach up um, if you're in a flare. Everything messes my stomach up. Even though Susan wants medicine for her HIV, the team first needs to test her blood to determine what medication to give her. But they've been unsuccessful. In the past, I was... Uh, intravenous drug user, which is one of the main reasons why they've been having a hard time, you know, drawing blood from me because I've, I've just damaged all of my veins. There's nothing but scar tissue. I'm wishing now that I, I'd taken better care of myself back then. What is some of the stigma attached to having an HIV positive diagnosis and then also living on the street? I've I've had to go to the emergency room where I was actually about to die um, twice now. And just the way you get treated is like, oh, she's just lying about it because she wants a free night stay in the, you know, in the hospital for free food and a warm place. And it's not until I get to the ER and they check all my vitals and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, you know, she, there is an emergency. We're human beings. Like, we're not all just crazy, you know, dirty individuals. At the base of everything, we started out human beings. So we're gonna do the lab work next week. Is that fair? So this has my name and our, our card. You know, I think at first blush, when you 
go by and see some in the encampments, you you think, oh, that person's dirty, or um, you know, why why can't they get a job? When you can uh, get their mental illness under control and their other health conditions under control, you see that there's a real person under there. Do you smoke cigarettes? Okay, you know what I'm gonna say about that. <laughs> Dr. Michael Hockman is the CEO of Healthcare in Action. And deep breath for me. He spent most of his career working in community health clinics with high-risk patients. Can you paint a picture of the homeless situation? The numbers are really staggering. Here in Los Angeles County, according to the most recent count, there's uh, more than 70,000 who are unhoused. Nationwide, it's more than half a million. And these numbers are increasing 10, 15% every year. Various reasons for that, various policy reasons for it, but it is truly not an overstatement to say that this is a crisis, this is a pandemic. Um, it's gotten worse by the COVID pandemic, but it was very much on this path before the medical care is one of the root causes of the reasons that people are homeless. Um, and I think if we ignore that issue, uh, all these other programs are just not going to work as well. How long has the, the ankle been bothering you? Most street medicine teams are funded by charitable donations. But Healthcare in Action uses a different model, with half its revenue coming from traditional Medicaid reimbursement rather than charity. What we're trying to do different is take this model that we know works and create a sustainable business model to scale it. So how does this program and programs like it affect the system as a whole? While some might question the cost, I think in the long run, this is actually a very efficient, high value use of funding. A typical emergency visit can cost well over $1,000, hospitalizations $10,000. That's a lot of street medicine we can provide if we can prevent one of those hospitalizations or one of those uh, emergency room visits. Dr. Hockman takes us to meet a patient who he says demonstrates how this model can help people get off the streets. This is actually the square where my tent was. Oh, wow. Yeah. This was where you were set up. Yes. For how long? Uh, about four or five months. Oscar first ended up on the streets nine years ago after he became addicted to crystal meth. I lost my family. They wanted nothing to do with me. I lost um, my possessions. I lost my apartment, my dignity. I lost my self-esteem. You don't really realize you're homeless until you don't have a place to lay down. A few months ago, he met Dr. Hawkman at a nearby hospital after he'd been attacked. The guy came at me with a knife, so I, I covered myself, I protected myself, and so he got me here, cut me here, and he cut me in the back of my arm here. Right here, I can see the scar. Right. What made you turn your life around? That guy. He pushed me a lot to get into uh, rehab. I, I Originally, I didn't want to go, and I finally, uh, dawned on me and I, I said, okay, let's do it. What do you think when you hear that kind of reaction to your work? You know, I think it, it was Oscar ultimately. I, and I think a lot of times we need to be, as you said, the person who jump starts the process. But since that's happened, it's all you, you're running with it. Um, you know, it's your daughter, it's your job, it's your life, it's your wife, it's all those things that are that are propelling you forward. And we're just so proud of you and how well how well you've done. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Oscar is living in a sober house and says he hasn't used drugs in four months. He's back in touch with his wife and his daughter and has a job working in construction. What kind of challenges do you still face on the road to recovery? When you're using, you're using to uh, mask emotions. So they, uh, they say when you get sober, you, the good thing is you get your emotions back, your feelings back. But the bad thing is that you get your feelings back. Whether you're sad, angry, happy, you know, you just have to deal with them. You have to ride them out. I've gotten better at it, but it's, you know, it, at the beginning, it's, it was really hard. What's your message to other people who might be in the situation that you were in? You know, even though you might not think so, even though Nobody tells you, you know, you're worth it and you are loved.
While the Healthcare in Action team has only been around for one year, they say they've already seen progress. Hospital readmissions are down 25% among the patients they treat. And they've helped more than 50 people get off the streets. All of us go through periods of trauma in our life. And usually there's somebody there to, to catch us. But a lot of these individuals, they didn't have that safety net. They didn't have, you know, that individual to, to pull them up. And what I love about our program is the fact that, you know, we get to be those arms, you know, that kind of wrap around them to pull them back up. <laughs> I wanted to focus on people of color, specifically women of color. I never saw women of color in leadership positions when I was coming up as a young chef. During the dark days of the pandemic, the restaurant industry faced a tough reality. Restaurants were closing and food insecurity was rising fast. But the difficult moment also opened the door to ingenuity and kindness. Famous chefs stepped in to help their communities by turning their restaurants into food kitchens. And it's a movement that continues today. Marcus Samuelson was one of those chefs. He owns 13 restaurants around the world and has won eight James Beard Awards. His cooking reflects a complex heritage and a desire to give back through food. Samuelson was born in Ethiopia during a tuberculosis outbreak, and he lost his mother when he was two years old. He was adopted and raised in Sweden. His flagship restaurant is the iconic Red Rooster in Harlem. His latest venture is a new restaurant in New York City that focuses on creating space for black female chefs to showcase their talent. I caught up with him there. Marcus, what an incredible space. And I, I certainly I want to talk about the restaurant and, and ask about this latest project of yours here in New York City. Before we get to that, though, I would really love to speak about your activism. I don't think it is a new thing, but it's certainly a newly publicized idea that we see more. This idea of the, the well-known chef, or celebrity chef as you want to yeah. say, sure, really lending their platform to help out others in need. What motivates you to do that and to help out these communities that you're in? I've seen it from my mentors on and on again, right? I was just a young pup when um, you know the tragics of 9-11 happened, and what did the chef community, how did we respond? We went down there, we helped out, and I remember being part of something when the city was so rock was very, very powerful. And I think that in combination of my background being adopted, coming from Ethiopia, being helped by an organization. So these two things, these two super big happenings in my life, that's always been something that I thought about. But also the equality of food, right? Our space, how can we make it not just delicious and great, but I can also make it uh, more diverse. As the pandemic happened, we at Red Rooster, we as a community, partnering with World Center Kitchen, partnering with Jose Andres, was very, very important for us. And we served over 200,000 meals during that time. So what exactly is World Central Kitchen doing? So World Center Kitchen is an organization that Jose Andres started out of Washington, DC. Anywhere, any place where there's any type of catastrophe, World Center Kitchen goes in, and serves food for the community that have been affected by it. And they partner with local restaurants to cook the meal and then hand out the food. And during the pandemic, that's what we did in Harlem and in Newark. And um, it was game changing. It was game changing in the community, but it was also game changing for us as a restaurant. We need to redefine what it meant to be a restaurant at that moment. You know, hospitality is not a business where you can sort of go away and work from home. You know, a friend of mine in the industry, passed away very, very early. So we knew in hospitality, we're on the front line. We also knew early that restaurants gonna close and will never open again. As far as your work with Jose, he said something really interesting about the two of you. He said that you have both been fortunate 
to feed both the few and the many. Mm -hmm. Who are the few and who are the many? Fine dining could very often be a very small space, right? Very often tied to high-end European restaurants. What we constantly try to do is to break that glass ceiling and present it to the many. Because great food does not have a zip code. It does not have an address. It should be for everybody. It is hard to fathom the roots of your life being at such a young age, your mother walks with you and your older sister 75 miles yeah. in Ethiopia in the middle of the tuberculosis epidemic. And then your mother sadly passes away and the nurse that was taking care of her, illegally, yeah. you might add, takes you and your sister in, sets you up with an adoption agency and gets you to Sweden. Two incredibly selfless acts that happen so early in your life. Yeah. How often do you go back to those moments? Once a year we go to Ethiopia just to see, say hi, but also to volunteer, but also for my family, for my own kids to see, this is where we came from. I can't fathom, I look at us like, how did we survive that, right? And I, I don't have the answer. It's just like, it blows my mind, right? There's a couple of things, a couple of ingredients in my recipe that I would never want to take away. Luck and the loving acts of others, of random others. You talk about breaking the law. Sometimes you have to break the law. Sometimes your action is ahead of the law. And one of my mentors, Ms. Leah Chase from Duke Chase, they've only run their restaurant in New Orleans for 90 years. She broke the law by serving black and white customers. You know, pre-integration segregation, it was illegal. She constantly told me this, if you want change, it's not gonna come easy. So the risk that I'm taking today, or the, my journey, when I compare it to huge risk takers, right? People who are really, you know, living in America, listening to civil rights movement, listening to Muhammad Ali, and people who really took risks, they put everything on the line. That's when I think about my privilege. In this current time in our country, we're still experiencing an age of division. And there's multiple kinds of division too, right? I mean, it's, it's not just, you know, left or right yeah. or whatever, Democrat, Republican. There does seem to be this opportunity to use food as a way to kind of bridge everybody. Yeah. Do you see that opportunity? Yeah. I really do. America, first of all, is this big beacon to the world, right? Where these big conversations can be had, should be had, and it's uh, healthy and sometimes an ugly back and forth. But once it comes down, very often, it lands just on the right side of right, right? And then you start the conversation again, and we've seen it with civil rights, we've seen it with the, the, the battles of so many different things. When I sit down with someone, it's classic New York table, with someone from Peru, somebody from Nigeria, or it's almost like a World Cup, right, at a New Yorker's table. And then you start realizing, oh, we have a similar flatbread. It's called, you know, pizza in Italy, and it's called flat bread in Egypt, and, and you start to see in the linkage like we share more things than we are apart. Have Amar, there's been a lot of talk, of course, about the food. There's also been a lot of talk about how diverse this staff is. Yes. For me, it came down to the two things that I never saw coming up. I wanted to focus on people of color, specifically women of color. I never saw women of color in leadership positions when I was coming up as a young chef. As we walk around here, you're going to see there is inspiration from the hut that I was born in in Ethiopia to, you know, this very sort of Swedish uh, wood and forest and environmental friendly uh, place that I grew up in. We're fortunate enough to have a great staff, right, that are New Yorkers and are really passionate about being here. That's number one. And then as a leader, it's up to us strategically to put people in positions that they can win and we can win. And as customers is, the food has to be delicious, hospitality has to be great. But then in the middle of all that, it's like, hmm, here's a place where women lead, women drive. The why matters, right? We're just gonna see how they taste on them and figure them out. I think as a person of color and as a person coming from privilege, it's a privilege to be able to open a gorgeous restaurant in Chelsea, right? So if you're gonna do that, with that privilege comes responsibility. How can you make the industry more diverse? 
It started at Red Rooster and it continued to build on here at Hop Mar. Obviously, as black people, we're not monolithic, right? Any community is not monolithic. We share many things, but we also have different backgrounds, right? So it's an opportunity to really show that in, in a different way. What specific experiences informed this decision now to really make it easier for the next Marcus Samuelson, boy or girl? Well, you're talking to someone that was actually told by a three-star Michelin chef that I could never own a restaurant. I could work in a restaurant, but I could never own a restaurant because of the color of my skin. That really does two things to you. You either quit or get stubborn and go deeper on that, right? So I say that now with ease, talking to you about it, but it was a game-changing moment in my career in those, you know, mid-90s days when that happened. And that's why I came to America, right? Because my parents believed in the diversity that is here. I am a dreamer. And I say to any young person, any person, hold on to that dream and multiply it by 10 because you can make it happen. If you have a community around you, if you find mentors and you find somebody that truly believes in you. And I've had all that. When your friends reach out to you, they say, hey, Marcus, I hear you got a new restaurant. What do you tell them about this place? Book a table. Ha, 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 ha.